Thanks, Dennis uh, and Archna. Appreciate uh, the invitation to be on this uh, esteemed panel with my, uh, a lot of my friends and, and uh, people that I respect a lot and their opinions in hernia. And I really want to thank you guys for coming back after the break. I thought this place would have cleared out and I'd be giving this talk to the uh, cleaning crew, but I uh, appreciate your attendance and staying here late for the very last session. So my talk's going to be on minimally invasive repair, talk a little bit about patient selection, although that's been covered pretty nicely uh, previously. But I'll also talk a little bit about technique as well, and, and certainly not insult the crowd, much of who I know how to do a laparoscopic uh, incisional hernia repair. Um, and additionally, I won't just talk about laparoscopy. Um, we'll talk a little bit about robotics as well, so that'll make this a little exciting uh, for some of you. Ooh. All right, there we go. Uh, there's my disclosure slide. Uh, I will show a lot of different types of mesh, won't mention any of them by name. You'll see devices as well, which uh, again, I tried to uh, uh, share the wealth and include as many different products as possible. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, which is actually a pretty decent place. Uh, we have our new medical school in that right upper quadrant there, very excited. We're technically an academic medical center, and particularly for the state of South Carolina, uh, Greenville's a pretty good place to be, so you guys stop in if you're near. So as we've already talked about this in this session ad nauseum, uh, the ventral hernia patient is not the easiest patient in your practice. Uh, a lot of times they have uh, failed either wound healing or a previous hernia repair for some reason. Uh, it's morbid obesity, it's the fact that they've continued smoking, diabetes, a, a lot of issues that uh, you as a hernia surgeon have to face. Uh, bring a lot of baggage to the table both figuratively uh, and literally sometimes with their ostomy appliances um, and that can certainly uh, complicate uh, these repairs. As already has been discussed as well, we have to be reasonable. We try to get these folks to buy in. We try to get them to feel like they're involved in their care. They have, quote, skin in the game. But as you know, and if anyone in here has the secret of how to get people to reliably lose weight uh, or to quit smoking, I would certainly love to hear your thoughts uh, because I struggle with that in South Carolina and, and not everyone is a candidate for bariatric surgery or has the insurance to cover bariatrics. Um, and they've smoked uh, every day, you know, since they were in the crib, and, and they have some relative who's 95 and continues to smoke, and so, you know, it hadn't hurt Uncle John, so why am I gonna stop smoking? Um, this concept of a functional abdominal wall or a functional repair is certainly a good one, uh, but does everyone need these big complex repairs? And so I still think laparoscopy has a great role uh, for the uh, uh, treatment of incisional hernia. Uh, it's already been talked about as well. These patients each deserve their own individualized approach. I think certainly most of us would agree that young fellow on the left is going to do better getting his rectus muscles back together. He has a very large defect there, uh, hiding his mesh preferably. He's probably going to need another operation at some point just given his age. He's going to need his colon taken out, gallbladder, something down the road. So to hide his mesh would be preferable. Uh, whereas we've got the South Carolina 3 on the right with a combination of morbid obesity, smoking, and diabetes. Um, to go in and do a big open repair is probably not wise in that patient. And so a small patch to prevent that person from incarcerating, I think, is a wise choice. So there are a lot of pros to laparoscopy. The one that's consistent throughout the literature and the one you continually see in the reports that compare lap to open uh, is the fact that you have a much reduced incidence of wound and mesh complications. Makes sense, much smaller incisions, you're going to have a smaller concern for uh, wound issues and ultimately mesh infection. Of course, the cons, it hurts. Uh, it's very uncomfortable, particularly if you use transabdominal sutures, permanent tacks. Uh, but the way we fixate the mesh intraperitoneal, I think we almost give these patients a peritoneal or, or peritonitis-like situation for uh, 24 to 48 hours after the repair. Um, and it, of course, most of these repairs are bridged, although more and more uh, surgeons are now closing their defects. And certainly the robot makes that easier. But as the procedure was initially described, it is a bridge repair. When you look at the literature, there's not a lot about how uncomfortable this operation is, which is interesting because a recent look at the AHSQC has shown that the majority of lap ventral hernia patients do not go home the same day as it was touted for years. This is a nice study actually out of a CMC looking at an international hernia mesh registry and comparing the Carolina's comfort scale. And you can see at six weeks, these patients had a higher incidence of pain or more reported pain and then more limitation in their activities at one month as well. So these evened out over 12 months, but initially anyway, the laparoscopic repair is probably more uncomfortable. Other things to consider when you compare lap versus open, a reinforce, reinforce versus a bridge repair, where you put the mesh, which has been touched on a little bit already, uh, the size of the defect, um, and then are there concerns for wound morbidity in these patients? 
So the whole concept of a functional abdominal wall, I mean, I think we all feel better when we close that fascia, we do that nice big open repair, component separation, we get everything back together, reinforce it with mesh. Uh, but again, you know, not everyone needs to go to these lengths. I mean, this guy's using his abdominal wall for pretty nice function as well. Uh, but to put him through a large open repair, raise skin flaps, and put him through the uh, potential complications of wound morbidity so that he can get back to the gym, uh, I think is probably not in his best interest. But we are given a lot more thought to reconstruct construction of the abdominal wall, not just patching a hole. And I do think that treating the linea alba much like the orthopods treat tendons and trying to reapproximate and put it under a little bit of physiologic tension with reinforcement of mesh is probably the preferred repair. Uh, but again, does everyone need to go to that extremes? Again, I show you a patient has a relatively small defect, previously failed repair. You can see the mesh is billowed up into the hernia defect. Um, you know, to do something uh, laparoscopically or less invasively and patch this hole because you just want to prevent the risk of uh, uh, complications of incarceration and potentially strangulation. Um, but a lot of people now in, in, in efforts to, to minimize some of that mesh eventration and to close that hole are, are closing things laparoscopically. And again, the robot certainly makes this even easier, uh, but laparoscopically it's not horribly difficult to make small stab incisions and then close these things in a transabdominal manner. Uh, this is very similar to the technique Yuri Nowitzki's described, a shoelacing technique where you just place several interrupted figure of eights and then pull things closed. Uh, together. Uh, you can desufflate or, or let the insufflation down if you need to to reapproximate. And then you lay a mesh in there that would be the size of the defect had you not closed it. Um, when you look at trials, you know, of course, not, shock, not surprisingly in the hernia literature, you're going to find some people that say this is crazy, it doesn't make sense, which is what uh, Jake Greenberg, Scott Roth, and Mike Liang showed in a multi institutional trial. A little less than 100 patients in each arm, and they said basically don't waste your time. It does not change your risks of seroma recurrence or surgical site infection. Um, however, another group did a larger meta analysis of everything in the literature comparing closing that fascial defect versus leaving it open for lap repairs. And you can see a little bit larger patient series, uh, overall less adverse. Uh, perioperative events when the patients had their fascia closed, a little uh, less than 5% versus 22%. Seromas was less in the closed group as well, um, but there was no difference in the recurrence rate or postoperative pain in those two series. Uh, where to put the mesh? You know, we gave a lot of thought to this, and, and my partner Alfie Carbonell was really concerned about this for a while. You know, placing all this mesh intraperitoneal, even with these nice designer uh, barriers that we have, um, as we all know, patients still form adhesions, um, particularly in younger folks, and, and that number gets older as, as I age, but, but I certainly consider someone who's less than 50 years of age, uh, their risk of having a, an additional operation at some point uh, is not insignificant. There is data to suggest that there are concerns. This is a study out of the Netherlands, and granted this was uncoated polypropylene, which was placed inside the abdominal cavity. If those patients required another laparotomy, you can see the risk of small bowel resections and fistula formation was not insignificant uh, in this patient series. Um, even a, a U.S. study, which is a little more uh, closer to home, if you will, and, and probably more using more barrier meshes, is a VA trial. Uh, the only predictor of unplanned bowel resections and enterotomy was the previous uh, history of uh, intraperitoneal mesh placement. So not insignificant to think about wallpaper in these patients' abdomens with mesh. Uh, we looked at our own series because we were quite concerned again about this. Uh, over a 10-year period, we had a, a little over 700 patients that underwent lap hernia. We did everything we could to contact these pa patients. Um, and yeah, a significant number of them do require operations, 17%, a lot of which is for recurrent hernias. Uh, but the incidence of bowel resections and uh, secondary mesh infections is, is present, but it's not uh, exceedingly high. Uh, so we're not quite as concerned about placing intraperitoneal mesh, but it is certainly something to give consideration to and have that discussion with your patient. So I still see laparoscopy playing a strong role in patients that you cannot mitigate their concerns for uh, uh, wound morbidity. And so folks that just aren't going to quit smoking in spite of your best efforts and that are very symptomatic from their hernia, um, uh, I certainly consider for a laparoscopic repair, patients that are just not able to lose weight, or let's say their BMI is 50 and they lose 50 pounds, you know, congratulations, now they're 46, uh, I still offer them a laparoscopic repair. Uh, when you look at the literature, uh, the lap repair does have um, pretty decent results. Now certainly there are going to be higher recurrences um, and complications when you compare it to, to non-obese patients. Um, but, uh, but it is feasible and you can have respectable recurrence rates. This is a, a series that Yuri Nowitzki looked at when he was in Charlotte. Uh, this is another series out of Israel comparing 
patients that went lap versus open repairs uh, in patients with a BMI greater than 30 laparoscopically had less wound infections. Again, that consistent theme that you see throughout with the laparoscopic approach and the recurrence rate, uh, both was pretty high, over 20%, but the lap group was slightly smaller. So when you look at the technique, again, not gonna go through this in great detail, but we essentially break it down into, into five steps. Getting inside the abdominal cavity, essentially do what you're comfortable with. We like to go off the midline, just underneath the costal margin. I prefer the right side, because if you miss, the liver's your backstop, um, but certainly the left side is, is uh, reasonable as well, but essentially avoid the midline, which you're kind of forced to a lot of times because of uh, previous incisions. Uh, we do like the optical trocars, you know, took a page from the bariatric surgeons, um, but again, whatever, uh, whatever you're comfortable with, whether that's a cut down varus or whatnot. Adhesiolysis, this is what gets us into trouble, obviously. You cannot leave that operating room if you have any concern for potential enterotomy. Um, minimize the use of cautery, uh, you know, fancy uh, electric cautery devices, uh, your bipolar shears, uh, ultrasonic shears. Um, don't really advise using those because if you cut something you want to see, uh, contamination so that you know that you have an issue right then and there. Uh, I think bringing the mesh in, sizing it appropriately, and orienting it is critically important. It's lost a lot of times, particularly when you've done a, a, a several hour adhesiolysis. Some of the positioning systems are making this easier for surgeons, uh, but remember you're placing this mesh, particularly if you're leaving your abdominal cavity insufflated, you're placing that mesh with five centimeters in a bisected um, uh, orientation. So you're not laying it flush against the abdominal wall, you're placing it in there fairly taut. If you measure your a defect much greater than it actually is, uh, then you're gonna crowd yourself out and have way more mesh than you actually need. Um, I certainly prefer to make all my measurements intracorporally, uh, but you need to have some sort of measuring system, whether that's desufflating and measuring it on the outside, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but again, I think intracorporally is the most accurate, but you do need to try to uh, appropriately size your mesh for orientation. I then grid the abdominal wall, certainly not necessary, but I think this keeps you honest and prevents you from sliding your mesh off the defect and cheating your overlap to one side or the other. Bringing the mesh inside the abdominal cavity, again, I think the reason why laparoscopy has such a low uh, concern for uh, infections of the mesh is because we never bring it into contact with the skin. Uh, so we'll cover the abdominal wall with Ioban, which I agree is certainly probably voodoo, uh, but it helps to uh, protect the mesh from ever coming in contact with that skin. And I drag the mesh through trocars, and you can either do that with some of the lighter materials, you can just drag it straight through, particularly if the, the mesh is not terribly large, uh, or you can reach across the abdominal cavity, uh, roll the mesh up uh, and introduce it through the trocar and then pull it in uh, intra-abdominally. So either way, I don't take the trocar out, I don't bring my mesh into contact uh, with the skin and, and minimize the risk of a uh, staph infection. You're gonna need some way to orient that mesh once you bring it inside. Again, I like the grid. Some folks use the positioning systems, but somehow uh, ensure that you're not you know, pulling that mesh over to one side or the other or not ensuring your five centimeters of overlap. Typically bring in one suture in the, in the uh, lateral axis and then one in the craniocaudat axis and pull those taut and then stretch the remaining two sutures to ensure that that mesh again is placed taut. At the completion, whether or not you use permanent tax, absorbable tax, I think that's dealer's choice. There's really little data to guide you either way, uh, but uh, I like that mesh to be fairly taut and like we like to say, you can bounce a quarter off of it. I, I like the uh, double crown technique. I think from a European data, that certainly helps with uh, potential recurrences. So now for robotics, um, I'm, I'm an innocent bystander in all this. I do not do robotics. Uh, my two partners uh, do an awful lot of robotics and it's been kind of nice to watch their progression. Um, whether you like it or not, uh, robotics is certainly here to stay and particularly for hernia. Uh, it's all over, of course, the internet, the International Hernia Mesh uh, Collaborative. Uh, you, you also see uh, the growth with this procedure. Uh, this is one that the industry has identified as going to be one they latch onto. Uh, so certainly hernia is becoming more and more uh, prevalent in the robotic uh, world, if you will. Some of the initial studies, this was actually in 2007, uh, surgeons describing in France, uh, placing their mesh intracorporeally, uh, or intraperitoneal rather, and suturing it with the robot. That was one of the benefits of the robot. You've then seen uh, American uh, series. This, Eric Wilson was probably one of the first to report his series of robotic eye palm uh, incisional hernia repairs, just kind of talking about the feasibility of it. Uh, others started closing the defect. You know, the robot would give you that ability with the additional range of motion. Um, and so now combining defect closure with suturing of the mesh, which of course took a little bit longer, um, 
but the, the thought is this could potentially be less painful and maybe improve uh, recurrence. Uh, this is Conrad Ballas, Oop, sorry, just showing a brief, I don't know how to get that to play, but just showing um, uh, a robotic eye palm, thank you, uh, and essentially replicating the same straight stick laparoscopic approach except with the robot. Now the benefits of the robot, of course, are closing the defect, but you have to look pretty hard to find the defect here, uh, just kidding, uh, but it's a Swiss cheese defect with a diastasis, uh, which is being closed uh, with a barbed suture, um, and then placing the mesh, of course, with one of the positioning devices and then the robot is utilized to suture the mesh uh, to the peritoneum posterior fascia without having to bring in transabdominal sutures and tackers. Um, and so one way, again, maybe to help with, uh, with postoperative pain. And this is just showing kind of suturing the mesh around the periphery. Um, others have really advanced this as well. You've taken the ability of the robot with the added motion that you get and movement that you get, and you know, can we replicate some of the open repairs? Can we do a STOPA? Can we do a TAR? Can we do some of these more complicated open reconstructions using the robot? Uh, Ricardo Abdala from Brazil was one of the first to describe doing uh, a diastasis repair in conjunction with an umbilical hernia by suturing the midline close with the robot. Uh, Conrad Balser and his partner, Brian Preble, uh, kind of reported their first series of doing retromuscular dissections, adding TARs uh, or, or transabdom uh, transverse abdominus releases where appropriate. Um, and so you're starting to see folks replicate the, the transverse abdominus approach, which I think a lot of us really like uh, in the sense that we're hiding that mesh, we're mobilizing the anterior midline uh, together. And so you can replicate this robotically. Of course, the concerns with this open repair is all the wound morbidity that you see uh, with doing this procedure. Uh, and so certainly problems with wound complications open. Laparoscopic, of course, you've got the intraperitoneal adhesions, maybe long-term adhesions with mesh placed inside the abdominal cavity, and then potential for secondary infections if the patient needs an operation uh, following that mesh placement. And so robotics is maybe a way to kind of bridge all this, gain the benefits of laparoscopy with reconstruction of the abdominal wall. And so my partner set out to sort of replicate that STOPA repair bringing the retro, um, retrorectus space or developing it and then closing it in the midline and then utilizing that transversus abdominus uh, release uh, where necessary. And so this is a brief video that um, uh, Alfie Carbonell put together just showing uh, particularly the, the dissection, which is a whole lot easier with the robot than it is straight stick, but taking down that posterior rectus uh, space, peeling it off the rectus sheath, and then once he gets out laterally, uh, it's actually a, a beautiful demonstration of the tar plane uh, where you get into uh, and release the transverse abdominus uh, and then uh, develop the uh, preperitoneal space out laterally. And so that's coming up here momentarily. And so you can see here where he's just releasing that transverse abdominus fascia and then you can see peritoneum and then I think the trochar starts to poke through here. So you can see how thin that peritoneum is, but again, the robot gives you that uh, additional movement and uh, ability to create these flaps. He has to double dock because we don't have the uh, newer model, we still have the SI, but he'll do the same dissection on the uh, opposite side. Then he'll close the anterior fascia with a barbed suture, place his mesh in this retromuscular space, and then reapproximate the posterior sheath. So you're essentially doing the stopa dissection and repair in reverse with the robot, hiding your mesh in the retromuscular space and reapproximating the midline. Um, Again, very much like we do the, uh, the open repair. And this is just showing, bring in an uncoated mesh, which makes the uh, repair a little less expensive, which I love how the robot guys always talk about how they're saving expense. Um, it seems a little counterintuitive to me, but uh, anyway. Uh, so now rolling the mesh, um, placing it in that retromuscular space, and then just suturing up that posterior layer. When you look at the results, when we compared our standard lap versus robotic, um, it takes a whole lot longer for the robot repairs. Uh, as they were first learning, these were, you know, four hour repairs on average. Some of these took up six, seven hours. Uh, so very dip, uh, long repairs. Interestingly, surgical site occurrences were higher in the robotic group. That was due to seromas. Uh, and some would argue they should be putting drains in that space, uh, which they still have not changed their practice accordingly. Uh, but uh, a lower length of stay, which granted is um, right at a day, but this is what's gonna have to be shown in order for the robot, I think, to consider to have traction. You're gonna have to show a benefit on the back end, less pain, getting them out earlier. Now, when you compare the robotic uh, retromuscular dissection to the open, um, this was a case match group that we looked at, 
similar for the, the typical uh, comorbidities that would cause wound complications. Um, again, much longer length of time for the uh, operative uh, repair of the robot, but way less surgical site infections robotically, which makes sense. You're comparing a minimally invasive approach to an open approach, and the length of stay is much greater for the, or much greater for the open repair. You see a, 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 a higher reduction with the robot. So early on, at least, it seems like there's advantages to um, the robot compared to a laparoscopic IPOM, at least in length of stay. There's now some America's Hernia Society quality collaborative data that would support this as well. Fewer wound complications when you compare the robotic to the open uh, STOPA. Uh, and of course, all of this is going to have to play out. This is very early in this experience. Uh, but I do think robotics allows for um, these complicated abdominal wall reconstructions using a minimally invasive approach. Uh, and it, it, again, some shorter length of stay in surgical site uh, infections when you compare them to the open. Um, I still think straight stick laparoscopy has an important role. Uh, again, really focusing on those patients that are symptomatic and you don't have the luxury of reducing their weight or their smoking cessation. Thank you very much.